AI tools like Midjourney and ChatGPT have generated enormous buzz, and now Adobe has just released their own text-to-image AI tool called Generative Fill. It's integrated directly into Photoshop, which is very exciting as this gives it unique abilities to work directly on your images. In this video, we'll take a quick look at several ways you can start experimenting with it. Note that Generative Fill is currently only available in the beta version of Photoshop, so you'll need to get it from the beta app section of the Creative Cloud installer. To get started, let's go up to the window menu, and then down towards the very bottom is this new option, Contextual Taskbar. When you click on this, you get this little pop-up menu of options that you can place anywhere in the screen. I like to move it somewhere where it's just sort of discreetly out of the way. And then in its options, you can check this option for pin bar position. This will just keep it from moving around as you work. What's going on here is that Photoshop is going to dynamically give you options that it thinks might be helpful to you at a given moment. So right now, because I just have a single background layer, it thinks maybe we want to select a subject or remove the background. I don't need to do those things. What I really want to do is generate a fill, but for that, I need a selection to actually fill. So let's use the lasso tool. And with my lasso tool, I'm going to go select an area where I can go fill and add something to the image. I'm telling Photoshop, I want to work on this part of the image. And now it understands that generative fill might be an option. There's several other options, but I just want generative fill. Now when I click on it, I get a text input and I can just click on here and type desert fox lying down. So I'm going to create a desert fox lying down in this part of the image. That's what I want to do. And that's part of what native embedding into Photoshop can offer is an ability for the tool to work directly with your image. That's the beauty of this approach. And all I have to do now is click enter or generate. And it's going to now reach out to Adobe servers in the cloud to go and try and create that new content for me. And then when it's done, it's going to show up in this new layer, which you notice has a special icon in the bottom right here, which indicates that it's a new type of smart object specifically for generative fill. And the first version it created here, I think, is really, really interesting. It not only created a desert fox lying down, exactly what I asked for, it put it in the part of the image that I wanted. It's backlit because it clearly understands there's a sun in this image casting harsh light here. And so the fur has this beautiful rim light. And then there's a shadow in the foreground because the animal's lying down and everything else is long shadows. And consistent with that is a shadow coming down into the right as you would expect in this part of this image. I think that's absolutely incredible. Now, is it a perfect result? No. And I can keep playing with this idea. You notice that for this layer in the properties panel, there are different variations it's created. So it went and created three versions for me to play with. So that's just the first one. If I click on the second one, there's a different one. I think its head looks a little bit strange. Not sure I love that one. And I'm going to let Adobe know. I'm going to click on the thumbs down. Wasn't perfect. Pretty good, but not what I really what I want. On the third one here, that's also not looking right. It seems like there's something a little strange here on the ground. So I'm also going to give that a thumbs down. Just have, give a little feedback for the AI. So I've got a couple versions I don't love. I'm going to go and delete them from my list of options, but keep this one and let's see if we can do even better. What I can do now is either revise my prompt or just click on generate to get more versions. So I'm going to click on generate and just keep working with that same desert fox lying down prompt, but just get three new versions to choose from. So this first one is, uh, I don't like that as much. Uh, second one's pretty similar. Third one, they all look kind of sleepy, not as interesting to me. So I could keep going, but I think I'm going to stick with this first version I created. I think that's really pretty good. Now, what we have here is this smart object with that mask. If I go and alt click on the mask, you can see it's that exact selection I created turned into a mask. If I were to shift click to disable it, it's kind of just created this little block of content. So it took my selection and a little bit extra and it created this mask here. If I just have the mask active, you can see that's exactly what it's showing on the image. So that's what we've placed in our image. And then the technology behind this, like I said, it's a smart object. You can't go and just double click to edit it. It's showing the layer style options for some reason here. It really should just show properties. So you can't just go and directly edit this, but it is a smart object. And the way you know that is if you go and right click on the layer, you can go choose this option for convert to layers. This would normally take a smart object and extract its contents. And when I choose this, you can see it's done that. All my four variations are now different layers here. So you can see here's the different versions as these layers. So that's internally what's going on here. And I don't need this. I could work with this version if I want, but I'm going to step back in history here and just keep my smart object because this will retain the ability for me anytime to go to the properties panel and keep playing with this. But it is helpful to know that 
each of these versions is being stored in the smart object. So if you're done with these, if you truly don't need them, you can go and click the little X to get rid of the unused versions. And that just makes your smart object a little bit smaller when you save the image to disk. So make sure my mask is active again. And now let's keep working on this scene. I think maybe now I'm gonna go select part of the sky and let's go add a falcon to the sky here. So I'm gonna go click on generative fill and let's choose a falcon flying right and I'll hit enter and we'll see what it comes up with. All right, so that's okay. Uh, look at the next one. It's a little bit flat to me. Third one, it's not facing right. So I'm gonna go click on generate and try three more. And here you can see we've got a couple different options here. So none of these are exactly what I want, um, but we could go work with one of these. Let's go pick something like this. I think it will work just fine. Now it's clearly too big. This bird should not be this big. It's not really a foreground element. I want it to be further in the background. So I'm gonna transform this. I can right click and choose free transform and just try and scale it down. But notice there's an issue here. Yes, I'm making the bird smaller, but there's all this surrounding stuff. When I'm done with this, the background has changed with it. Because remember, if I shift click this, it's this whole area of content around it, including the surrounding background. So I've got a bit of an issue here in that it's hard for me to move, oops, let's undo that. It's hard for me to move the animal around or to resize it because it's bringing me through all that background stuff. And for that, I want to take a different approach because the Lumenzia Basics panel, starting with version 11.4, has an ability to work with generative fill and it offers some little value added options. Let's go and delete this layer and let's go and create a selection again. Something up here, it's probably still too big. And rather than using this uh, taskbar, let's just move this out of the way. I'm instead going to use the fill button in the Lomenza Basics panel. I'm going to click on that. There's various different options for filling. If you're working with a Photoshop beta that supports generative fill and you've got version 11.4, then generative fill will be one of your options. And you see this option here for auto mask subject. When you turn this on, it's going to try and extract the subject from its new background so that we'll be able to change it. So now I'm going to go click on fill. And I get a prompt here and we'll call it Falcon, Falcon flying right and go generate that. And if you're watching carefully here, you see that mask actually revised right as it placed this content. Watch this mask here. When I click on the next bird, you see that changes a little bit here. What's happening is this mask is no longer like the fox here, which is my selection but the bird now has actually masked out the actual bird. And that's what the Lumenzia Basics panel is doing because of that option that I had to auto mask it is cutting it out. So now if I like this bird, and I think that's pretty good, I can transform this with Command T. And now as I shrink it, notice that it's not causing that background problem. I can move it wherever I want in the image, maybe shrink it down a little bit more, right click, let's go make it face to the right. It still didn't get it facing right. I think that looks better, hit enter. And now I've got that there. I think it's a little bit dark. So I'm gonna go and go add maybe a levels layer, which I can now clip to this layer. And it's only gonna affect the bird and not the surrounding background because we've got this enhanced mask. And let's just bring up the levels a bit to kind of make that bird feel like it fits a little bit better, something like that. And maybe just lastly move it a little bit, something over here. So a little bit more energy in the scene with these animals kind of gone from here to here, and you start to see the power of these various tools. And there's so many other things we can do with it. For example, maybe I wanna take this image and I wanna post it on Facebook as a banner, which is a very, very wide format. So this is not nearly wide enough if I wanna do that. So let's zoom back a bit. And I wanna expand out the right and left-hand side of this image. And I can do that by hitting C for the crop tool. And if I option click, I'll pull up both sides. Something like this is probably about the right proportions. Hit enter to accept that. And now I've got this open area here. Now, if you're, if you're still working with the uh, taskbar in Photoshop here, what you'd want to do is select these open areas to fill them in, and you'll have to expand your selection a little bit. But with the basics panel, we click on fill. It's just automatically going to understand we've got some blank areas to fill in, and it's offering the option to either use the standard content aware fill or the new generative fill. So I'm gonna use the new generative fill. 
And when you expand the background here, you don't want to type anything in the prompt. By leaving this alone, it's just going to add more of what it thinks is already in the image and hopefully give us a really nice wide panoramic version of this image. And so now I have some options to choose from. The first version has some artifacts I don't like. Second version uh, is looking much better, but there's kind of a strange little mountain area here, there. And this third version, that feels like that's consistent. I think that's gonna work just great. And also I'm gonna note if you zoom in here a bit, there may sometimes be some lines. And if you see that when you're working with Photoshop manually, just be careful to expand your selection. The basics panel is taking care of that for me, so it's not really a concern here, but just something to watch out for. So now I've got my widened image, which I think looks really good. I've got some work to do in the sense that it does look a bit darker. So I'm gonna have to edit these areas a little bit to make it match, but you can see that that wouldn't be a whole lot of work to finish that. And now I have this much more wide and interesting scene, which carries the shadows and all this other great content. So very, very interesting result there. And in fact, if I wanna affect that brightness, let's go do that right now. Let's go bring in a new brightness contrast layer. I want to clip it to this layer so it only affects the sides and not the middle of the image. And now we'll just bring up the brightness until it feels like we don't see an obvious seam. Somewhere around there is just a little bit of adjustment. You see there was dark and now it kind of seamlessly blends together and that looks pretty clean. I still would have to do a little bit of work on my shadows, which I'm not going to dive into, but that'd be a relatively straightforward fix to match that if that's a concern. But on social media, it's probably going to look something more like that. It's really not a big deal. And you can imagine, you know, maybe a few months or a year from now, as the tool keeps improving, we probably won't even have something like that to deal with. So we've added a couple of different subjects. We've expanded our image. The next thing I'm thinking about is maybe removing some distractions. Let's zoom in here. This little background area, I'd like to remove that. And there's a few ways we could go about it. We can go create a new layer. So I'm going to Command Shift N. And for that, I can go and grab the new Remove tool. So by the Healing Brush is this new Remove tool. And I can actually go and just kind of paint over the areas I want to remove. So this pink stuff is everything it's going to try and remove. So this is kind of like a new smart version of content aware fill. I want to make sure I paint over the cast shadows in this area as well. I can probably hit this whole inside. Try and just, you know, clean this up. And usually the remove tool does a pretty good job. Let's see how it does here. And that's, that's pretty good. Um, not perfect. I can go give it one more brush here, maybe a little brushes here and here, maybe even hit that once more. And that's a great result. Let's go hide that layer we created for the move tool. And let's now see what would happen instead if we use the new generative fill. So I'm going to create a lasso selection, try and kind of take some care to hit the contours of this, make sure I grab the selection around the uh, shadow area, of course, because we also want to get rid of the shadow. Something like that, go click on the fill button in the basics panel. Of course, we're gonna do generative fill. We don't need to auto mask it because it's a complex background. Click on fill and again, leaving it blank. So we'll just see what happens when it tries to fill in the image with more of what it thinks should go in there. So no text prompt is usually the way you'd go about removing things. It's not explicitly asking to remove things, but oftentimes can yield that result. And that looks great. I mean, between the two, I would say generative fill is, to my eyes, more interesting. So I'm going to stick with that, even though the, I think the remove tool did an admirable job. And certainly the context of an image this far away on social media, either one's going to be great. And then for one last cleanup, there's some desert grasses here I don't love. Let's see what happens if we try and select them. This might work. This might fail. I really don't know. So we'll go select that area here. And we'll go again and just quickly fill that with a generative fill leaving it blank once again, and we'll see what we get. And I think that's actually pretty interesting. It's not perfect from a photographic you know, level. If I was going to print it, that wouldn't work. But for social media, that works great. And I think that just kind of cleans up a bit of clutter in that part of the image, simplifying things a bit. So at this point, let's now go take a look at the original image. We started here with a smaller image. We've got some clutter in the background. We have got no extra subjects. And of course, it's not wide for social media. And now we've got something that really could be a lot more interesting. Still needs a bit of work to refine the edges here. I can still see my colors a little bit off, but that'd be relatively straightforward to fix to bring this home. Now for a comparison's sake, I've also got my own headshot that I previously edited using Stable Diffusion. And I thought it would be helpful here to try and compare the results between what Photoshop is doing and what I got previously with Stable Diffusion. So let's go and select 
Oops, go maybe something like this. I'm going to go select and create sunglasses. I don't remember exactly what I did. I honestly haven't watched it recently, but something like this to go and generative fill. And let's go and put in sunglasses and generate that. And that's okay. They're not perfect, not quite passable, but in a small version that'd work. That's definitely not okay. Let's go send a little feedback on that. And it's third version, eh, not what I had in mind, but it's passable. So you can imagine, you know, there's some, some good options here. We'll stick with that. And let's see about maybe changing the uh, shirt here. So let's go and I'm going to go and do, try to be somewhat careful about lassoing this area here. Try and select around the shirt, give it the kind of leeway it's going to need. And then coming back around here. And I think what we'll do is let's try this as a leather jacket. I think that's what I did last time. So we'll take this, go click on fill in the basics panel. We'll do our generative fill. Don't need auto mask in this case and put in leather jacket. And it's not bad. It's a little strange in the chest area here. That's not quite working. Uh, that definitely doesn't work there. And third version, that's probably the best. So a little showier than I want, but I guess it is what it is. And let's try changing to something else. Instead of a leather jacket, why don't we try white shirt? So imagine that we're instead just going to create something totally different. This could be a stock photo where maybe you've got someone wearing a, a red sweater. And it's too bright. So you want to change it to a more subtle brown sweater. And that's done a pretty good job there, I think. Uh, we try a few different variations. So that looks uh, the best so far and probably even better. So, I mean, that's pretty interesting, right? To take this image from before to after. So I think just like Stable Diffusion did a pretty good job of merging things, uh, Photoshop has done a nice job here in replacing content when you select and replace it. But there is a case where I think it works in a different way and it doesn't quite have what you might call a style transfer. So with Stable Diffusion, I merged a whole image and turned myself into a charcoal sketch. We're not gonna get the same result here. So in this case, if I go and I can't just directly fill, I have to do something with it. So I'm gonna select everything and let's go and do a fill. And I'm gonna tell it uh, charcoal sketch. And when I render this, what I'm gonna get, what I'm hoping I would get would be a charcoal version of my self portrait. That would be my ideal is to just convert from this image. But what's gonna happen instead is it's always trying to fill the area. And so since it had no context at all, I selected everything. It's just giving me some totally different charcoal sketch. So yeah, it did give me what I asked for, but it wasn't really what I meant. So for that, you're still going to need to work with a tool like Stable Diffusion. Hopefully that's the kind of thing we can expect to see from Adobe in the future. I think this is a very exciting first beta, and I can't wait to see how this evolves over the coming years. Now to learn more about artificial intelligence, click on this next video.